Hey guys, I hope everybody's having just an awesome day today. I know that it's good to be back to the place where COVID isn't the biggest thing in our world, right? Where life's just a little bit more normal than that. And I know we all feel like a new beginning being breathed into our souls. And to me, that's really, really exciting. You know, we have such an awesome promise in Jeremiah 33, where God says, call unto me and I'll show you great and unsearchable things that you don't know. And today we're gonna to talk about that. We're gonna talk about how to steward our hearts in a way that new beginnings really turn into something that's really, really cool. So I think we're gonna enjoy our time together. I have a dear friend of mine for over 40 years. Uh, I think I met him when I was one, right? No, uh, life goes by quick, but a, a lot of you know him. Some of you may not know him, but Pastor Rob Koch, along with his wife, Laura, pioneered Shoreline Church in Austin, Texas in 1987. And I really think at their launch meeting, they kind of looked at each other and they said, we're it. I think that's kind of what happened. But uh, people didn't launch churches back then like they did today, but now they minister to thousands every single weekend. And uh, I'm looking forward today to hearing Rob talk to us about how to steward our hearts so that God can take us into really treasured memories and treasured experiences. And I know that's gonna happen today. So Rob, welcome man. Thank you for making time. Well, it's a, it's a real privilege to be with you guys and looking forward to our time together here today. Yeah, I was thinking uh, when I was coming on, I think it was actually like 1981, whenever you and I, we, we might've seen each other, but we started hanging out a lot more. And uh, so it's been a long time and, and you know, been through uh, a lot of great ups, been through a few downs, you know, that's just part of life. But uh, today you're gonna talk about something that's, that's really, really good. And that is that it's not just all by happenstance. God has a plan. He always wants to work for good. You know, a, a lot of people have different stories about their journey. And I look at, you know, what's taking place here at Shoreline. And we've had the, you know, the privilege of walking through this journey from the very beginning, literally, it was just Laura and I looking at each other at all the things that needed to be done. And, uh, you know, we nowadays you got launch teams and you got, you know, financial backing and you've got, you know, lots of strategy and insight and in how to plant churches uh, effectively. But uh, back um, when dinosaurs roamed the earth, when we started, <laughs> we, uh, you know, we had to figure it all out. And so it was, uh, it was certainly a, a a learning experience. And now actually I find ourselves after all of these years having to relearn uh, so much of what we thought um, about church life because it's just radically different now. And so if you don't have a posture in your heart to always be learning and always be growing, um, you'll, you'll be left behind somewhere along the way. Uh, so it's important that we um, keep that open heart and open mind to new ways and new things and and strategies and ideas from God to, to really make a difference. Yeah, the reality is whenever you and I started launching our churches, we didn't have a launch plan, but there were a lot of spiritually hungry people who were looking for churches. So, you know, th times change. I remember when my boys were playing high school basketball, they came and they got my little book that had all my stats in it. And so I snuck upstairs and put my ear to the door thinking they would say something good about my stats, you know? Instead, they were laughing at the shorts I wore. That's what they were doing. <laughs> Whoever wore shorts that short. And so, so times change and, and really to understand the times you have to be in those times to understand why things were working and all that kind of stuff. But, but what's even more difficult sometimes is to discern the time that you're in and to have God help yeah. you read the times that you're in so that you make the kind of choices that take you forward into what God has. And I really look forward to talking about that today. Before we get started, we always like to welcome new members to the network during this time. And uh, so I'm gonna welcome a number of new members today. Uh, Pastor Justin Allen from Dearman Fork Free Will Baptist Church in Chaton, Alabama. Pastor Scott Bloyer from Elevation Christian Church in Aurora, Colorado. Pastor Austin Asiki from Redeemed Christian Church, Montclair, New Jersey. Pastor Michael Green, New Community of Hope, White Plains, Maryland. Pastor Brian Allen, uh, Bucharest Church of God in Bucharest, Ohio. Pastor Jeffrey Lukup from Mount Hope Congregational Church in Livonia, Michigan. I've been there. 
Pastor Sam Luthi from Bryan, First Assembly of God, Bryan, Ohio. Pastor Brent Mandaris from New Haven Church in Somerville, Georgia. Uh, Pastor Jim Mead from Stafford Church in Ridgeway, Iowa. Pastor John Parks from Peaceful Valley in Maxwellton, West Virginia. Pastor Jimmy Powers from Family Life Church in Kaufman, Texas. Pastor Dale Small from New Hope Community Church in Sequim, Washington. Pastor Rodney Taylor from Riverside uh, Drive Church in Auburn, uh, Maine. Pastor Jeff Thompson, One Body from Albany, Georgia. Pastor Walt Wellburn from First Christian Church of Fort Stockton, Fort Stockton, Texas. Pastor Steve White from Mission Next Gen, Augusta, Georgia. Pastor Jervy Windham from Resonate Church in Lamarck, Texas. And Pastor Don Wolf from Cornerstone Worship Center in Vestaburg, Michigan. And hey, listen, whether you're watching this live today or maybe you're gonna watch it later on demand or watch it off our website because we archive every single session in those places. Uh, we want you to know this is really just a relational network. It's on a mission. And that mission is to see pastors and to see their teams just reach the dream, the God-given dream that God put on the inside of their heart. And we have no doubt that happens whenever people get involved with relationships they enjoy, that cause them to get the support and the training and the resources that they need. It's not just a fun journey at that point, but God fulfills His will. And that's really what we're all about at Significant Church. We wanna help pastors, wanna help their teams, and we wanna see the least reached places in the world get reached. So my heart was thrilled to read about those small towns that have churches that are, that are believing God to do great things. We do it four ways. We have our weekly webinar, or, or bi-weekly webinar, I'm sorry. That means every two weeks we bring somebody on that I know you and your staff would love to have lunch with. You gotta buy the lunch, but we bring on somebody that I know you're gonna love spending time with. The second thing we do is we have a ministry warehouse. Our website gives you all kind of free stuff. The third thing, we have exchanges across the country where pastors are getting together with other pastors and other staffs, building great relationships. And then we'll have our annual leader summit. And you can go on our website to read about that. It's gonna be awesome this year, the last week of January. So we are thrilled that God's up to big things, especially in places that have been praying for that to happen for a long, long time. So, well, Rob, let's get started. Let's, let's talk about how we do this. Um, let's, let me just uh, begin by saying what an honor and a privilege it is for, for me uh, just to, to hang out with, uh, with you and with these fine pastors and leaders from around the country. Um, you know, what you guys are doing is changing the world. And I am absolutely convinced that the greatest, um, the, the, the greatest uh, joy in the world is to lead a local church. And it's God's plan A for every single community. And so to link arms with you and just kind of share a few minutes together uh, where we can learn from each other is, is a real joy. And Jim, let me just uh, take a moment to uh, speak to your leadership and to the vision that you have to uh, build significant churches all around the United States. Um, wow, what an incredible thing that you're doing. And it's an honor to be uh, with you here today. Oh, well, thank you so much. It's, uh, you're right, the local church is God's dream and it's gonna be his dream and he believes in his dream and it's gonna be his dream till Jesus comes back. And it's a joy to be a part of that. I mean, Fortune 500 companies come and go, but the church lives on, right? So, yeah, church is awesome. but, but you know, for me, I remember I was in a counseling session with this uh, husband and wife years ago. And you know, he was listening really, really good. We guys tend to do that. But finally she just got mad and she said, pastor, do you know that scripture about work out your salvation with fear and trembling? I said, yeah. She said, he's not trembling much. You know, <laughs> basically she said he would go home and just forget everything we talked about. And uh, for me, my life was that way. You know, if God's gonna do more than I'm dreaming of, if he's gonna do more than I ask him to do, I really have to get rooted in his power. And that can't just be a head thing for, for me, that has to be a heart thing. And I've watched you do that really, really well over the years. So I've really been looking forward to today. Well, when we think about um, what it takes to build a, a thriving, healthy church, um, I remember hearing this way back when we first got started. I don't know if Rick Warren was the one who coined it or he got it from somebody. Uh, but the idea that 
Um, the whole idea is not necessarily to grow a church, it's to build healthy churches and healthy churches will in and of themselves grow. And in order to build healthy churches, you gotta be a healthy leader uh, and you gotta be a healthy person. And, and so when you, when you think about, you know, the nuts and bolts and that, 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 um, that idea is the same, whether you're starting a church, whether you're 10 years in, 15 years in, or like, you know, you and I, Jim, we're, we're now in this thing for 30, you know, five plus years. And we're finding ourselves in a season where we got to reinvent what we do. We've, we've got to think outside the box because, you know, COVID has changed things and, and the, the economy is a little bit different and the way people relate to the church is different. And so if you just said, okay, I, I learned the lessons from 30 years ago and now they apply forever, that's not necessarily true. But there are some things uh, that we can lay hold of that's true all throughout the journey. And I think that's the things that I wanna focus in on for a couple of minutes together here today are the things that never change. So um, when you think about uh, you know, what does it take to build a great church? Uh, I like to think about it in terms of a, a few of these kinds of ideas that we need to do everything in our power. And then we're gonna fill in the blanks of those as we go along our talk today. And there's probably maybe seven, eight, nine things that we can, that we can apply but you know, the very first thing is that we need to do everything in our power to, um, to live with authentic devotion. Uh, do everything in your power to live with authentic devotion. Um, again, the idea that uh, everything comes from the heart, that everything that we do starts from the heart, uh, gets expressed through the heart, your spirit uh, will always speak louder than your words. Um, you can fake it for a little while, but after uh, a season of time, people are going to know whether you believe what you believe and whether you're living what you're teaching. Um, and so, you know, we, we, we can never get away from the reality that our hearts need to be right. So as Christian leaders, as pastors, we've got to do everything in our power to model uh, what you know, an abandonment to Christ is really all about. Wasn't it the Apostle Paul who said, follow me as I follow Christ? That we, we, We've got to have that mentality. You never graduate from being in love with Jesus. Um, when, you, when you think about your marriage, uh, you know, I still remember because, you know, Jim, you were my best best man in my <laughs> wedding. So you had a rings up seat at this event. When Laura was walking down the aisle and, you know, she was, you know, my bride-to-be, there were tears, you know, going down my, my cheeks. I was so excited. And, and I wasn't thinking about all of the things that Laura would do for me. I wasn't thinking that now I was going to get a good meal, that I would actually now uh, have somebody who could help me dress a little bit more fashionably, that the house would be cleaner. I wasn't thinking about all of the things that, you know, she would do for me. She was the prize on the wedding day. And she just being able to live my life with her was was what we were really truly celebrating. And in, in, in that same way, Jesus is always the prize of Christianity. Not all the things that Jesus will do for us and, and how he will help us, but the reality is, is that we get to enjoy this wonderful, awesome, amazing relationship with the living God. And, and I think authentic ministry flows out of the overflow of that love relationship with the Lord. Yeah, it does. And I mean, you kind of jarred my memory because I remember when we gave Tamara and Laura some money to buy us clothes and they laughed at us like, yeah, so exactly. the, is, the problem's way enough. bigger than the seed you put in my <laughs> hand right here. But, but you know, it's, that's such a good point. And, and you're talking about it privately, but even publicly. I remember one of my early ministry lessons, I was working for my father-in-law at the time. And literally he showed me a letter somebody wrote to him that said, why when we're in worship is Jim Graff looking all over the sanctuary and why does he interrupt Tamara? And I thought, oh. And the reality was I had the job of making sure that every section of his large sanctuary was 80 to 90% filled. So I was checking on ushers to see that they were doing their job. You know, there was no excuse for interrupting Tamara. 
But the reality is I've talked to our staff about that now because sometimes worship will be going on. You'll see people fellowship and you'll see ushers fellowship and in the sanctuary. And for us, it really does start, doesn't it, with modeling that worship is life changing, that experiencing what God does in my heart during this time is life changing. Fellowship and building the right kinds of bonds with the right people is something you don't want to live life without. Uh, discipleship right. and letting God define your potential instead of your past and letting God empower your potential instead of whatever else you're looking to. Uh, living on mission and making a difference. Those kind of things are not going to be contagious unless we, we do what you just described. That, that's really, really good. Well, at the end of the day, you know, I think that it's very easy to uh, slip into a mode of thinking about ministry where um, it becomes a little bit more of a business than it is, you know, this uh, outflow of the heart. And I think all of us are guilty of that. You know, I can walk into a, a service on Sunday morning and be very, very conscious of, you know, the sound of the music and, you know, the, uh, you know, how the lights are organized, what's on the screens behind the singers. And, and, you know, you're looking around the auditorium and you're wondering, you know, where all the people went that were there last week, you know, and, <laughs> why they're showing up 20 minutes late for service. You know, you can, you can always get wrapped up in, in the midst of, uh, of those kinds of things. Uh, but at the end of the day, it's not about the business. Yeah, you, you got to make wise business decisions. You need to be a good leader. And we're going we're gonna to talk about that. But before all of that, it's about being in an authentic relationship with the Lord. And I don't know about anybody else, but for me, um, my authenticity meter lasts about 24 hours. And, you know, I can connect with God and have this beautiful sense of, of his presence in my life. And I walk throughout the day aware of his goodness and aware of his grace. Um, but it takes me about 24 hours to need another connecting point, meaningful connecting point. And that's not to say that you just meet in the morning and then, you know, you, you, you go your way. Um, you, but I think it's really important to have that authentic time uh, in your schedule. It's what we talk to our congregation about, uh, you know, having your quiet time and making sure you're having you know, a time in the word, not just for preaching messages, but for your own personal growth and development and praying, not just about church life, but about, you know, what's really happening in your own soul. Um, and, and so as a leader, I think it all starts there. And so we got to do everything uh, in our power to live uh, with authentic devotion. Yeah, so if we're doing it for God, we're in trouble, right? But yeah. if we sense God's doing it through us, then okay, now we, we got at least a step one. So yeah. what, what's the next thing? Yeah, so then, you know, once once we got that solidified and we're living out of that overflow and I, um, and, and you know, I'm, I'm recognizing times and seasons in my own life where, where things get a, a little bit crazy and you even feel, um, you know, this sense of, of burden and, uh, maybe a challenge to keep your motivation as strong. Um, that's why you need to make sure you're connecting daily. Because if you miss those, then th that problem actually gets even more challenging. Second thought, uh, we need to do everything in our power to keep our purpose clear. Uh, because I think in every person's ministry uh, and every you know Christian leader that I've ever, I've ever talked to, um, they face the challenge of vision drift. Um, just like, you know, you go out into the ocean and, you know, you're, you're floating on the water and you, you don't realize it, but there's a, maybe a little bit of an undertow and it's taking you away from, you know, where your family is and where your friends are. Um, it's very, very possible for you to start a certain way. And then as you're getting involved in the work of the ministry, there's vision drift. It becomes about other things. You're not aware that you're not where you started and, and you've lost sight of what it really is that you're trying to uh, accomplish. And so you, you gotta know what your vision is. Every single uh, time I stand before our staff, uh, whether it's a leadership class that I'm teaching, whether it's staff chapel, and you know we have a meeting, everybody does these things a little bit differently, but for us here at Shoreline, uh, we, we have a staff leadership uh, every single uh, week of some kind, whether it's staff chapel, staff leadership, staff coffee. Um, we're, we're getting together every single Tuesday morning and we're starting our time together. We also have a weekly prayer meeting uh, that we have. And every single time we get the staff together, I ask them this question, what's our vision? 
and uh, they'll shout it out back to me. Uh, you know, Shoreline exists to help people know God, find life, and make a difference. And so we we recite it, we shout it, we celebrate it. I'll ask them from time to time, is that vision still fresh for you? Uh, is it is it still something that's waking you up in the morning with excitement? Is it still something that you're you're resting your head on your pillow at night and thinking about how to make it more effective? Uh, but you want to make sure you keep that vision clear. Uh, you might know the vision, but if your staff doesn't know the vision, then there's going to be vision drift. Uh, you might know the vision and your staff might know the vision, but your church may, may not know the vision. And our goal is to make sure that the people from the front row all the way to the back row have some kind of understanding what the vision really is all about. And so even on Sunday morning, you know, I'll talk about, you know, our vision to know God, find life, make a difference. And I always put it in these three because that's uh, the, the team, our volunteers who help us accomplish the vision, we call them our three team. And so because they're the ones that help us uh, to accomplish the vision of helping people know God, find life and make a difference. And we're always trying to find creative ways to communicate that vision. And so from time to time, we'll have, you know, people who will do a little selfie video and from a, a you know, from a hike on the, on a cliff and give us the, you know, the, you know, the threes. Um, there was an airline pilot that had one of, you know, uh, their flight attendants take a picture of him behind the cockpit, you know, given the threes. Uh, one of our congregation members, you know, was doing a film special for ESPN and team, Tim Tebow was on the special. And so we had Tim Tebow do, you know, the threes. And, and so we just find fun ways and creative ways to keep the vision fresh. Because when you got fresh vision, you've got direction, you know where you're going, you got protection, you know where you're not going, and you've got motivation, the inspiration, you know, to see it through. Yeah, and I, you know, I, I've always loved that story and I may not get it 100% right, but I think it was uh, Walt Disney's wife that came to Disney World in Orlando. And his brother Roy, I, I believe is the one that like really did everything to make this vision happen after his death. And so when the wife showed up to the dedication service, I think Roy looked over and said to her, hey, wouldn't Walt love to see this? And she said back, he did. That's why it's here, you know? Uh -huh. and, and, and planning is part feel, and it's also hard work. We have, some, we have a, an archived uh, webinar that's probably the most watched we've had, which is how to plan for the future of your church, how to take a word from God and actually get down into the guts of it so that you can make it happen. And uh, if that's something that, that you haven't learned to do, then in a volunteer-based organization, it's gonna, it's gonna turn into chaos really, really quick. There has to be some really, really good planning and structure, but feel always trumps the structure. So, so those three things, you, you, we definitely want to have that spirit throughout our church. Tell us what's next. Well, even when you, you know, you're thinking a little bit about that vision part of it, and this isn't anything um, new, uh, but um, all things are created twice, right? And, you know, we've heard that over and over again throughout the years. It's first created in your heart and then it's created in in reality, you need to be both the architect that designs the building, and then, you know, of course, God's the builder, but you got to get your hands involved to do the work in partnership with, with God's, you know, power and presence and wisdom. But there are always those two elements uh, to the process. And then we got to do everything in our power to walk by faith. Um, you know, at the end of the day, uh, the truth is, is that, um, is, is that God responds to faith. I'm just reading, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm in the Gospels right now in my own personal devotional time, and it's just catching my eye over and over and over again how um, Jesus says words along these lines, let it be done unto you according to your faith. And if, if, if faith didn't matter, then he probably wouldn't have said it. Sometimes I think we get to, to this idea that God's just going to do what he's going to do, and it doesn't matter what our posture is. It doesn't matter what's going on inside of us. He's just God, and he's, he's sovereign. He just does what he, what he does. But I think the truth is, is he often responds to our faith. And it's not so much how large our faith is. It's just the focus of our faith. Uh, you know, Jesus said, if you have the, the faith of a mustard seed, you can move mountains. And so it's, it's, it's the... 
It's the quality of our faith in the sense of who it's placed in. It's not faith in yourself so much or faith in your own dream. It's faith in God that gives you the ability to, to move forward. And sometimes there's no substitute for that. And I've got to, um, I've got to check every once in a while, you know, you know, you check your fuel gauge, don't you? Uh, right now, you know, as I'm sitting here, as I was driving to church this morning, my, my oil gauge on my car, you know, the light popped up, you know, you got to change the oil. Uh, and, and so we got gauges that tell us if we got enough gas or we got enough, uh, we've got enough oil. Uh, but do we have a gauge that tells us about our, our faith level? What's, what's going on there? And we need to pay attention. And so when we find ourselves worrying and anxious and afraid about what's taking place in our world, that's a pretty good indicator that we need to do a little bit of hard work to check the level of our faith. You know, you see these incredible men and women of the Bible, they, they walked by faith, they spoke their faith, they, they expressed this vibrant relationship uh, with God. And it's not just enough to believe uh, in God, you gotta believe God, right? You gotta make that connection where you believe his promises and, and you know that he is uh, with you. Um, the reason why I, I, I included in it, because it, it might seem a little bit basic, but I still remember uh, we were in, in our church uh, for about two or three years and everything that you could imagine was going wrong. We had key people in leadership that had no connection to the vision of our church. They had their own agendas. In fact, they came out of other churches to our church and there was a whole group of them and they were very vocal and very bold and and they had ideas about church life that that were just foreign to me. Uh, but you're at a stage, you know, where the church is young and you want people in the church. And so you tolerate all of this stuff. And and it was all going downhill fast. And Laura and I, you know, we just looked at each other and we said, we need a miracle. We just need uh, we need God. And there was a song that came on the radio. And I know this will probably date me a little bit. But um, where there is faith, you know, that song. Yeah, I, I yeah, yeah. Remember, you, know, was, you dated me too. Like, where there is faith. Yeah, 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 yeah there you go. <laughs> Not that you want me to sing any more of it, but that yeah, is the song. Yeah, yeah. I, if you want this webinar to end very quickly, go ahead and sing that song. Right, right, right. right. Uh, but again, I was just reminded at the, at the beauty of faith and how important it is in our journey. Yeah, I mean, it absolutely is for me. And, and I don't know if you dealt with this, but I think a lot of people did. I, I had to learn the difference of being educated by faith or, or seeing faith as an education versus really it empowering my life. You know, where in Hebrews 11, it says, I believe God exists and he's going to be a rewarder. And, I, you know, I've learned don't take the step till you believe he's going to be a rewarder. That doesn't mean you don't take that step with fear in your heart and doubt in your heart because you do. I mean, God can minister to you and then you're like, oh, man. But uh, anytime God's any major thing God's done in my life was more him than me. Uh, you know, there were things that honestly it, I could point back. If God didn't do this, this wouldn't be here, you know. Uh, okay. We still have to do our best, but but that's true. And but what I had to learn is, I think it was something Moody taught when he said, "Don't pray for faith." He said, "Faith comes by hearing and hearing God's word." And so, and, and it's not just like reading God's word to say it or anything, but it's reading until God's wisdom, or the wisdom of mentors and books I read, or the wisdom of something. Finally, my heart becomes convinced, okay, I, I can, God, you want to do this and I can do it with you. Let's, let's do it, you know. But I had yeah. to get, be, I really had to make a decision that I, you know, because I can't, you know me well enough, I'm real practical, you know. Yeah, and, yeah. and so I just, when, when it was just an education, I was just kind of hoping it didn't work. I had to find a different kind of faith. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, it, it was, you know, just thinking a little bit about Jesus's interaction with Peter. Um, you know, when, when, when uh, he was having that whole conversation about the struggle that Peter was going to have in his life. And, and Jesus says this, and I always find this fascinating. He said, um, Peter, I'm praying that your faith would not fail. And you think about all of the things that, that Jesus could have prayed for Peter. You know, I'm praying that your friends will not fail. I pray that your heart would not fail. I pray that your, you know, that your um, that your skill wouldn't fail. I, I, pray I pray you won't sell me out. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, 
But he, he said, I pray that your faith would not would not fail, because I, I just think that's that's something that's critical. And we lose sight of its of its importance, I think. Um, I, I think a lot of times entrepreneurial minded pastors uh, struggle with the combination of how important it is to walk by faith as well as garner all the strategic information and impact and leadership development that you can that you can add to the equation. Um, yeah. We've got to walk by faith. Well, emotional faith is awesome. I, I've needed faith as an anchor so many times in my life. Honestly, just throw down an anchor. But uh, I've needed faith to mature me too, you know, yeah. so. Yeah, no doubt. Um, do everything, number four, do everything in your power to preserve unity. Uh, do everything in your power to, 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 to value uh, unity. Uh, unity is a choice. There are no perfect people uh, in the world. Uh, there's no people, perfect people on the planet. Uh, your church is filled with imperfect people. Uh, your staff and volunteers are all imperfect. And if you haven't noticed, when you look in the mirror, there's an imperfect person there. <laughs> So, you know, all, all of us are imperfect, right? Every one of us have got our flaws and we've got our issues. Um, one thing that, I don't know if you remember this, Jim, we were, we were reading uh, a, a uh, documentary. We, uh, for those who don't know, Jim and I traveled together for three years doing missionary work literally all around the world. And we smuggled Bibles into Russia and held crusades in Uganda and, and took young people on short-term mission trips together, you know? So we've got a lot of history, uh, but there was one uh, article that we were reading about the number one reason why missionaries came off the field. Uh, and I've always you know, thought about this because it's, it's absolutely fascinating to me. Uh, it wasn't the difficulty of the language barriers. It wasn't the harsh living conditions. It wasn't the struggles about raising money and all of that. The biggest reason why missionaries came off the field is that they had trouble with the relationships with other missionaries wow. uh, in the work that they were trying to accomplish. Wow. It was relational conflict that kept them from uh, fulfilling the call that God had on their lives. And I think that sometimes we have unrealistic expectations. We think that Christians are gonna be perfect. Oh, if I can only work within a Christian organization, then all the problems would disappear. But that's not <laughs> really true. Yeah. And you have to purpose in your heart as a leader to um, to, to absorb the, the, the faults and failures of others. You got to be mature enough to handle, you know, flawed individuals and do everything in your power to, uh, to value unity. That is so good. I, I can't tell you the number of times I've looked at people who were, who were in the midst of conflict and I would say to them, you know, I've got some 40 to 50 year friendships. Can I talk to you about them? And mm -hmm. I said, there are times that when they didn't want to be my friend anymore. And there are times I didn't want to be their friend anymore. I said, but we all want what we have now. We want what we fought through to have. And that's why Ephesians says, make every effort to keep the unity of the spirit in the bond of peace. It's an effort. And uh, I, th I forget who it was, but they say that that was the phrase they would say to gladiators. Cause I think if you won like six times, you, you were set free or something back in the day. And so before they would fight, they would say, make every effort. And the truth is most relationships are gonna die just because people don't make the effort to make them incredible. Every single friendship, every relationship, every marriage, even parents to kids, every single relationship in your life has to cross the bridge of forgiveness. Yeah. And, and not just once, I mean, over and over again, you know, <laughs> the truth is uh, we've gotta be gracious with one another as God is gracious. That's uh, good, uh, good. So, you know, just talking about uh, building great teams, building a healthy church, building a, you know, a healthy environment where people can serve. Uh, this is probably one of my favorite topics um, is we got to do everything in our power to uh, be the best leaders we can be. Do everything in your power to become a great leader. Um, I, uh, I think that if you stop growing, your church stops growing. Um, I think that, you know, there is so much that we need to learn and you can learn from everybody. I don't care if the church has uh, five people in it and it's a small group. Uh, I don't I don't care if it's your grandchild uh, or if the church has, you know, tens of thousands of people. You can learn from anyone and you ought to have that posture and mindset of learning all the time. 
Um, you know, I was I was reading a book as I often do on leadership uh, the other day, and and so this isn't uh, stuff that came from from me. It, it came straight from a book called Atomic Habits. But I was actually sharing it with Jim this past summer as we were on a little uh, uh, get together as we as we do every year uh, with our wives just to hang out and you know glean some wisdom and insight from each other. Uh, but we were talking a little bit about uh, a study that was done about 10 years ago on how habits are formed. You know, you have the cue, right? And then you've got the craving, you've got the response and you have the reward. Well, uh, the author of Atomic Habits took those four um, ideas on how habits are formed and he created it, uh, a, a system to help people behave the way they want to behave uh, for their best life, whether it's as an individual or as a, as a company, as a corporation. And so he said, you got to take the cue and that is you need to make whatever it is you want people to do obvious, make it obvious. And then you have, um, you have the craving that is, you got to make it attractive. And then you have the response. You got to make it easy. And then you have the reward. You've got to make it satisfying. So this whole idea of, of understanding uh, cue, craving, response, reward, make it uh, obvious, make it attractive, make it easy, make it um, satisfying. Um, boy, that, that's so revolutionized uh, you know, the thinking on our staff. And so you know, as we're getting back from COVID, uh, we had no volunteers, right? We, <laughs> we went from zero people in church to just a handful. And then we had to rebuild entirely all of our serving teams. And we're not even there yet. We still have lots of room uh, to add to our serving core. Uh, but we've been tracking about 70 to 75% of the amount of people that we need to serve on a Sunday morning. That's what we have right now as we're you know, matriculating back from COVID and trying to understand you know, what our church is gonna be like moving forward. And so we set the goal as a staff, let's set the goal in the spring of this year that we're gonna go from 70% to 80%. And we say, well, how do we do that? Well, how do we wanna change the behaviors of the people in our congregation? Well, we took some lessons from this particular book. We gotta make it, um, we've gotta make it obvious and we've gotta make it attractive and we've gotta make it uh, easy and we gotta make it satisfying. And, and so we followed that formula for getting people involved in volunteering, make it obvious, that's why we announce every single Sunday morning, a volunteer of the week. We show their picture on the screen. We talk about what they're doing to make a difference. We want to make it obvious. We want to make it attractive. We built a room in our uh, sanctuary, we, we, you know, in, in our hallway, one of our classrooms that was a, uh, you know, a classroom that wasn't being used. And we repurposed it to be volunteer central, a place where all of our volunteers can show up Sunday morning early and uh, they can get food and snacks and drinks and just hang out. We wanted to make it attractive. And then we wanted to make it easy for them to get involved. And so we streamlined, streamlined our growth track to, to make it as easy as possible to get people from the pew into uh, the serving team. And then uh, we wanted to make it satisfying. And, and so the whole idea of, of creating opportunities where we get feedback uh, from them on, on how they're doing and, and how they're how they're experiencing serving at Shoreline. All of these things uh, will help to build our core. Well, all of that came from a leadership lesson that I got from a book and it's revolutionized our serving core. We're seeing some amazing positive uh, changes take place in our church environment. And I only bring it up as, a, as an example of a new fresh idea applied in the work environment that will help you do uh, what you're trying to accomplish. Most of the time, uh, we can we can all agree that the problems that we have in our in our church uh, are are leadership problems, and often the solution is a leadership solution. We just got to get the right people doing the right thing in the right way with the right heart, and when that happens, uh, great things happen uh, in our environment. So I want to challenge all of us, me included, to be the best leader to continue that leadership journey. We never. The biggest room in, in all of our churches is the room for uh, improvement. Yeah. Well, Pastor Timothy Mwanzia uh, said, man, that was absolutely profound. And I agree with you 
that that was absolutely profound because that that was worth the price of the ticket. That was worth the whole webinar right there. And uh, because remember what Isaiah said whenever, you know, man, they were going to lose the, their sovereignty as a nation. The Assyrians were going to come and Isaiah is telling them it's going to happen. And then he says, but don't fear. You're like, what? Don't fear. Don't fear what they fear. Don't call a conspiracy what they call a conspiracy. Hear any conspiracy theory stuff going on today? But no mm -hmm. matter what happens, stick with no God, help people experience life, make a difference, whatever happens. That's what this church right. is about. We're going to know God. We're going to help people experience life. We're going to make a difference. And whatever else is happening around us, the church is going to be established on those pillars for a long time. That was, that was, that was just fantastic. I want, to, I want to let you know, I'm, I'm going to be quiet because I want to get through all of these. But I want to let you know you can ask a question. We'll give you time for a question. If somebody has a great one, I'll look at them and, and pick the one I think is best. Sorry about that. But OK, Rob, keep going. That was great. Yeah. Let, let me just even uh, expound just a little bit on this whole idea of leadership, because there's a huge difference between goals and systems. And I don't know if you if you, uh, you know, understand, but there's kind of like a debate out there in entrepreneurial America among Fortune 500s and Harvard Business Review and different different, you know, like what's What's the most important thing? Is it a goal? Uh, you, you always hear that, you gotta have goals, or is it the systems? And I'm, I'm kind of you know, on this journey where I'm understanding that both are really important, but one actually trumps the other. You know, because if you think about it, uh, like the sports teams right now, um, you know, Jim's a baseball fan, I'm a baseball fan, and you know, we got the playoffs coming now, you know, and we got the World Series right around the corner. Every single team that started at the beginning of the season had the goal to be in the World C uh, to be in the World Series. Every single one of them had the same goal. But what is going to differentiate? Let's say the you know the perennial uh, powerhouses like you got the Dodgers, who for the last couple of years have you know been in the World Series and have been at the top, winning over a hundred games every season, and you got the Houston Astros who, you know, for the last couple of years, even with changing rosters and whatever, have been at the top of the win totals for the last couple of years. You know, it's longer than that, just so you know, because he likes the Yankees. I want you to know it's been a lot longer than a couple of years. The Astros <laughs> have had a great, I just want to yeah. pick on you a little bit. You're not yeah, going to beat him yeah, this yeah, year yeah, either, because Verlander is, he's, he's throwing, he's throwing better than ever. So anyway, no. that's, that's my prediction. Go ahead. Yeah, well, the, the, the Astros have had the Yankees now for the last couple of years, and I'm tired of it. Uh, <laughs> this is the year it's going to change. But here's the point I'm trying to make. Everybody's got the same goal, but what teams are doing right now is they're looking at the Dodgers, and they're looking at the Astros, and they're saying, how do their systems produce uh, game-winning uh, teams every single year, year in and year out? And so that when we talk about you know church life, what, what are the systems that we have in place? And really, when you think about systems, they're just a collection of habits. They're uh, all the things that we do to make things obvious, attractive, easy, and satisfying, right? Uh, around all of the significant priorities of our church. So Jim and I were talking a little bit about, you know, what is it uh, at the end of the day, what's the goal of the local church right when you have somebody sitting in your congregation what's the what's the goal is that they 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 want to become more like jesus we want them to become more like jesus and there's a you know there's a word associated with that you know we want to create disciples uh, make disciples of all nations right and you know a study was done on how disciples are made right and discipleship is made uh through um through seven things this you know research has proven that these seven things build disciples, someone who sits in an atmosphere where the word of God is taught, someone who sits in an atmosphere of worship, someone who, who cultivates private devotions, someone who serves with their gifts and talents, someone who engages in authentic community, someone who shares their faith with other people, and someone who honors the Lord with their giving, right? Those seven spiritual practices produces a fully devoted follower of Jesus Christ. My question is, what habits are we instilling? What systems do we have in place in our church that cause all seven of those things to blossom in the hearts of the men, women, and young people of our, of our churches? And, and then the goal as a leader is to get 1% better on all seven of those priorities 
every single week, every single month. I just want to get 1% better at creating an atmosphere of worship. I want to get 1% better at creating, you know, chemistry and community and camaraderie. I want to get 1% better in, in raising up leaders who will, who will use their gifts and talents to serve. I want to get 1% better at challenging people to honor God with their resources. All of those things produce fully devoted followership of Jesus Christ. And as a church, you know, that's what the leadership process is all about, helping our church to get better. Well, that's awesome. I'm going to review and then we're going to we're going to try to get these last ones in in about 10 minutes, if that's possible. But we'll yeah, see if it's not. You're going to have to come back. And uh, <laughs> I know good. I need to buy lunch for you doing this today, but I'll buy you two lunches if, if we don't get it done. All right. But live with authentic devotion. Keep your purpose clear. Walk by faith. Value unity. Be a good leader. And then what's next? Number six, do everything in your power to walk in love. Love is the currency of the kingdom. People are not an inconvenience. They are the reason why we exist. Every once in a while, I'll hear a pastor saying, I hate my people, but God's called me to this city. I just hate, you know, that they're just, you know, losers. And, and at the end of the day, you know, I get it. You know, people can be difficult, but we're here to love. You yep. know, we're just here to love. And, uh, and, and don't, uh, don't allow um, the people in your congregation, you know, because there's always going to be some people who, uh, you know, are cantankerous and unreasonable. And, you know, you know, we look and we think, oh, we just got beautiful sheep in our family. Well, sometimes sheep can bite, you know, <laughs> and sometimes they can act dumb, you know, but we, we are called to absorb, you know, some of that dysfunction. And just remember that, that our goal is to walk uh, in love. Number seven, do everything in your power to live joyfully. Um, this is the day that the Lord has made, and I will rejoice and be glad in it. Uh, and Jim, you could probably speak just a little bit into this because we uh, we get together every single year, and one of the uh, stated goals of our getting together, and, and there's a number of us that graduated from school together, and we just kind of hang out together uh, every single year, and our wives you know, join us on the journey. Um, but one of the stated goals is just to have fun and to enjoy life. Uh, because at the end of the day, joy is our strength. Yeah, you know, one of the things that, that I think has to happen for that to happen is you have to concentrate less on solving problems every day. And you have to think more about taking steps that are going to cause you to end up somewhere you really love, you know? Mm -hmm. So I, I, I don't care if it's like we've been through some tough things together. I mean, you lost a child in, a, in an auto accident. That that was as hard a thing as I ever did coming into your house and knowing that that was something that happened to you. Uh, I, I had a disease that doctors told me I wouldn't be alive today if I had overcome that disease. And I still remember calling you. You were somewhere, I think a theme park somewhere. And I called you and t I told you I got the report. And you like screamed in the theme park, you know. That's what friendship's all about. But you can't solve every problem. God has to help you. But what mm -hmm. you can do is you can enjoy every moment and you can take steps of faith and you can say, ah, man, I really believe these steps I'm taking today joyfully are going to take me somewhere I'm going to enjoy. So I'm going to enjoy the moment. I'm going to believe better tomorrows are possible. And I can't, I can't tell you the joy I've had as a pastor, and I know you have too, and I know the guys watching have too, that when we can get people to quit being stressed out and trying to solve everything and instead choose joy, enjoy the moment. What are you going to enjoy this hour of your life? What are you doing that you believe is going to make life enjoyable down the road? It just has a lot of power. Yeah, and you, you got to find that thing that refreshes you, that replenishes you, that brings you happiness yeah. and brings you joy. Because, you know, if we're all being honest, there are times in ministry where you feel like giving up. You, you feel like, you know, the sermon you just preached <laughs> dribbled off your chin and landed in a puddle right in front of your feet, you know, and you don't feel like anybody's heard what you had to say. And, you know, attendance is down, money's a little bit off. COVID and all of the ramifications and the challenges that we face in building churches in today's day and age. Um, there are more people leaving the ministry now than ever before. They're just saying, I give up, I quit. And so it is vital that you find those things that bring replenishment and joy into your life. Uh, the hobbies um, that, that really do bring um, life-giving uh, refreshment to you. Um, it's, not a, it's not a side issue. It's critical to your long-term health. That's awesome. That's awesome. I, I love eight. this next one. Yeah. 
and <laughs> do everything in your power to pray. Uh, you know, this is I, I, this is probably something <laughs> yeah. that's on this list more for me uh, because I, this is where I feel like I I really struggle to to um, to to pray with the kind of authenticity and power that I know God wants me to pray with as a pastor. I'm so much more bent to doing things and and trying to solve a problem than I am to putting it in God's hands. Uh, but I'm learning over and over and over again just how vital and important it is that we pray as individuals, we pray as team members. Uh, we did something last night. Uh, we have a first Wednesday worship service and it's just all about praise and worship and communion. And I've never done this in 35 years, but we did it last night. We turned the whole evening into, a, you know, we had this worship component at the beginning. And I shared a couple of minutes on prayer. And then we had an old fashioned kind of prayer meeting where we just said, you guys That's can walk cool. through the building That's and cool. just pray over all the seats. We've got a women's conference coming up this Friday night. We wanted everyone to be prayed up. And uh, we, we printed out a list of prayer, you know, priorities and you could just join us. You can kneel at your seat, you do whatever. And it was so special and I'm just thinking, it's only took it's only taken 35 years to to you know to have a meeting like that we we pray every monday as a staff i can't emphasize enough just how important it is that we do everything we can to pray yeah yeah i i, I couldn't agree more and it's but the only way to really love prayer though is to make a strong commitment to prayer and mm -hmm. and you said something earlier i think you said 24 hours that you said i i, I can get 24 hours and you know, if you can't get 24 hours, and there are times that I, I, there are times in my life I couldn't. You know, David said seven times a day, I'll praise you, you know? And whatever it takes to keep spirit filled through your day, it's worth it. And even if it's like, you know, an hour in the morning and 10 minutes before you start every next part, it, it really is life changing. Yeah, yeah, no doubt. Number nine, uh, do everything in your power to inspire hope. Um, you know, I, I, we, we live in a world, um, you, you guys know this as pastors and leaders, it's just a, a little, little bit of a, a reminder. Um, I, I am always shocked uh, when I leave church on Sunday morning, having met with people in the lobby, having talked with people who are um, going through some of the most difficult and heartbreaking experience, experiences that you could ever imagine. And it's not just once it's every single Sunday our church is filled with people that are walking through divorce or just heard that they have a life-threatening illness, um, maybe some financial reversals, maybe a relationship, a, a son or a daughter that's incarcerated or, or w whatever the, the situation is. It's just a nonstop reality that people are going through difficult times. And, and so in, in the midst of every single service, there has to be some hope. There has to yeah. be some some place where people can receive prayer for their hurts and their and their issues, where they can receive encouragement. Um, if people aren't leaving your services feeling better than when they came in, then you got to make some adjustments. Um, there, there's got to be an atmosphere of hope in what we uh, do. And, and hope is simply that an expectation that tomorrow is going to be better than today. It's the expectation of future good and that God's gonna work work it all out. And if it's not good yet, then God's not done yet. Um, I mean, I say that almost all the time in, in our service. If it's not good in your life yet, then God's not done yet. And we're standing with you, we're believing with you, we're trusting God to do a miracle um, in what you're facing in life. Yeah, you know, you said two things today that really are gonna go with me. You said a lot of things, but two of them are the part when you talked about sheep Tam and I were in Vermont last week and it was the last morning. So I said, okay, babe, where do you want to, what do you want to do? She wanted to walk down this path through the woods to see the sheep one more time, you know, mm -hmm. and she'll call the sheep up and she'll do what our wives do, right? So then we come home and Jeffrey has a service on the University of Houston Victoria campus and the service ends and sheep start coming up to me. And I sat down with the girl who who her boyfriend just broke up with her and a young adult court uh, thing, that's the big one, right? So then the second one, uh, a guy was engaged and his, he had to call it off because his girl, girlfriend was lying to him. And it, it really is, uh, it, it's something that, I, I know there's a book, I forget what it's called, but they study like thousands of churches on every continent. Uh, and, and when they talk about why churches grow, it's things like love. It's things like putting hope in people's heart. 
is like being a place where people can engage easily and make a difference. And I think sometimes as leaders, I know I am, maybe some of you are, but it's so easy for me to want people to believe in the vision and to sell out to the vision and to do those kind of things. But what you learn over years is that when you believe in them and you sell out to serving them, then that happens. They sell out to the vision. But I wish I could tell you I learned that when I was 32 and have practiced it perfectly since. But the truth is, I just got to remind myself. Yeah, that's good. And uh, and then just kind of closing, I know we got uh, just a couple more minutes, but do everything in your power to give your best. Um, you know, I was uh, reading an article. I'm a huge Yankee fan. And uh, this week, Aaron Judge uh, hit uh, 62 home runs, more home runs for an American League uh, batter than ever in, in baseball history. And uh, he was talking about the changes that he made in his schedule and in his life to become the hitter that he's evolved into. Because the very first time he was in the majors, he batted like 179 and struck out 50% of the time. So now batting over 300, almost a triple crown winner, 62 home runs. He talked about how committed and dedicated he was to studying every single pitcher he was gonna face and how he evaluated hundreds and hundreds of pitches. He would get them downloaded on an iPad and he would just watch you know, how that pitcher would throw and he would just kind of envision you know, how he was gonna approach each at bat. And it just reminded me that there are people out there in our world, there are musicians, there are business leaders, there are baseball players, there are, there are all kinds of professionals out there uh, that really do give their best to their craft and to their careers. And I just wanna make sure that we're reminded as pastors and leaders that we have the greatest cause to live for in all of the world. It's not just about a profit. It's not just about a entertainment. It's not just about hitting home runs. We, we are in the business of emptying hell and populating heaven. We, we, we are involved in the greatest cause in all of human history, the cause of God's kingdom. And we ought to be committed to giving to God our very best. If you ever struggle with that, I just encourage you to read Malachi chapter one, uh, because it's a study, a fascinating study. You know, the prophet comes and he notices that people are offering up to God any old sacrifice. And he has this indictment against the children of Israel. He says, how dare you give to God that which you wouldn't even give to your governor? And it was just this statement ringing. How do we offer up to God any old thing? when he has given to us his very best, his only son. Um, and so, you know, one time at our church, we had the privilege of hosting the governor. And, uh, and, and so I was talking to our staff and I said, okay, here is a real life example of what we're talking about. Are we gonna do anything different this Sunday because the governor's coming? Are we gonna put our best praise and worship leaders on the stage? Are we gonna have our best looking greeters and ushers out front? Are, are we gonna make sure that the building is extra clean? Uh, the governor is coming to town. Well, let me tell you something. Someone far greater than the governor comes to church every week, and that's the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. But let me tell you someone else who's more uh, that's more important, and that's every lost and hurting person, every member of your congregation that's going through a difficult season, every faithful person who's a part of your church family that wants to sincerely grow in their relationship with God. They are worthy of our very best. So let's do everything in our power to serve our people with everything we've got. That was awesome. That was, man, it's so good. Thank you so much, Rob, for being a part today. My soul's filled. And when you were talking about that, I, I heard somebody say this, that they went from trying to build a church people would wanna to come to, to, to building a church that God would be pleased by everything that happened. I thought, man, that was a really, really yeah, good thought. thought. That's kind of the, the, the vein you were in right there. It was so good. Well, hey, Two weeks from now, Pastor Joe Caminetti Sr., a guy I admire so much because in the middle, he had the biggest church in his county, didn't think it was exactly what God needed for a new era and just redid it and went through the hard times, but totally rebuilt it. And he's gonna be talking about finding uh, our voice. He's gonna talk about church and culture and finding the voice that God put within us. So that's gonna be awesome. 
in just two more weeks. And I uh, want to encourage you, go on the website, check out the conference. Uh, it's going to be really, really amazing. And what we can't wait at our, at our annual conference. First of all, just great insight. There's just great insight. But then there's fantastic fellowship and just a whole lot of fun. So we hope you guys will check that out. And Rob, can I ask you to pray for everybody before we... Yeah, be honored. Father, we thank you so much for this time together. Um, Lord, I just pray that you would take uh, the words that we shared together here today and uh, serve your purposes with it, Father, in the ways that only your grace can. Father, you know what each pastor needs, what each leader needs. Uh, Father, I just pray that you would take these words and inspire and, and strengthen uh, each and every one of us for the cause of your kingdom uh, and all for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Again, thank you. That was fantastic. And guys, knock it out of the park this week. Uh, we'll see you in a couple of weeks.